Okay, well, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, and this project actually goes back to a question of Peter McNamara at the conference in Mulude about this year. And uh, he encouraged me to write this down. So yeah, I also want to thank him for this. Yeah, the title for my talk today is Serialarity of the Picas and Lustig Basis for Symmetric Groups. And here is um, what I want to talk about. So my talk will consist of um, five parts. First, I'll start by recalling the robinson schoenstatt correspondence. Uh, Schoenstatt correspondence. And uh, explain basically its connections to Kassanustich cells. Then in the second part, I want to introduce um, the p Lustig basis. And in the third part, I want to want to precisely describe p cells for symmetric groups. And in the fourth and second to last part, I want to mention some beautiful consequences of the um, Perron Frobenius theorem. And its consequences for P cells. And in the last part, I want to briefly mention the cellularity and explain um, what kind of goes into this proof. Okay, so let me get started with the first part. So recall that the robinson schoenstatt correspondence gives us a bijection between the symmetric group on n letters and uh, pairs of standard tableau of the same shape with n boxes. And to a permutation w, I want to denote the corresponding pair of standard tableau by P of W and Q of W. And <clears throat> so um, in order to kind of explain what this has, um, yeah, I mean, let me, let me start by giving a little example how this works actually. So uh, here I've given, I've chosen an element in the symmetric group on eight letters which in the string notation is just 6284517 and to this um, to this element to this permutation you can apply what is called the row bumping algorithm in order to obtain uh, one of the two symbols and this works as follows so you start with the um, with the M, uh, with the empty tableau and you kind of successively start pushing uh, entries into this and whenever you insert a number you first try to into a certain row, you try to check, you first, you append it to that row if it's larger than any other element in that row so that you preserve kind of the property of, of being increasing within the row. So for example, this is a case when you apply six and you push six into the empty tableau, then you just append it to the first row. But then the next step, if you push two into this diagram, you'll see that you cannot just append it to the first row so you need to replace this, the smallest number that is larger than two, in this case, six by two. And then you'll try to, to, end, to kind of insert the number you've replaced um, into the next row. And then so this, the six gets bumped into the next row and it will be added in the second row as the second row is, um, is still empty. And so if you add, if you add um, eight here, then you'll see that it's larger than any entry in the first row, so you can just append it to the first row. Similarly, then if you if you push in four, this will bump eight to the second row, and so on. And if you push in um, if you push in five, you can append it to the first row. One, if you push in one, this pushes this two into the second row. The two pushes the six into the third row, like this. Seven can just be appended to the to the first row, and three. Um, in this case, pushes four into the second row and four pushes eight into the third row. And this, um, this is kind of the output of the row bumping algorithm, what you obtain in this way. And this is one of the two symbols 
In this, uh, in this case, this is the P symbol from our element W. So this gives you one part of the Robin Schuster inside correspondence. Okay. And um, the second part of the Robin Schuster inside correspondence is, um, is the recording tableau. And so this uh, actually just remembers in which order we have inserted the, the boxes. So you see, we first inserted kind of this box here. Oops, well, I didn't, yeah. We first inserted this box. And then next to this, after that, we inserted the box underneath. In the third place, we inserted kind of the box to the right of this. And if you keep going like this, then you, um, you obviously get a, a tableau of the same shape. And this will be the, the Q symbol for our bijection. Okay, so I hope this is, um, pretty standard and most of you know this. And so what does this have to do with cells? So in order to talk about Kastanostich cells, I need to first introduce um, the, the Hecke algebra. And um, for this, I want to fix the Coxetto system. So I fix a, a Coxetto group W and a set of simple reflections S. So the set of simple reflections S gives us particularly nice presentation for our um, for our group W. So all the elements square to one and they satisfy generalized braid relations. And for us, of course, kind of the main example throughout the talk will be the symmetric group, but we'll also look at other, other cases. So in this case, we'll just look at the symmetric group on N letters and um, the set of simple trans, um, transpositions as simple reflections. And then in order to get the, the Hecke algebra, one deforms the integral group ring and um, when, so this will still be um, an algebra that will now be free over, it will be free over uh, Laurent polynomials in one variable. So for us V and um, the basis given by our group elements, this um, kind of gives us the basis here, which we'll denote by HW. This is the, what is called the standard basis. And they satisfy um, the following well-known relations that if I multiply HX with HY, then this gives h x y if the lengths of these elements set up, uh, add up. So this is just uh, the Bruja length. So you can also define it in terms of a minimal word in terms of the generators that you need to express this element in our group. And you kind of, as I said, these elements in S are simple, ref um, they're simple reflections, so they would square to one. But now we introduce kind of uh, for the quadratic relation, we now introduce this deformation term where we say HS squares to V minus V inverse HS plus uh, the identity. Okay. So, <clears throat> and the motivation for Kastan and Lustig to kind of um, introduce Kastan and Lustig cells. Well, I mean, first they introduce uh, the famous Kastan and Lustig basis, but the motivation to introduce cells afterwards was to explicitly construct representations of the Hecke algebra. We know that we have a deformation of, um, of the integral group ring and the TITS deformation theorem, for example, tells us that a generic parameter, our uh, representation theory for the Hecke algebra should perform, uh, should behave as kind of like um, the, the group does, as a representation theory of the group does. Okay, and so, <clears throat> so the first step to kind of define kastan lustig cells, of course, one needs to introduce kastan lustig basis. And Kessler and Lustig do this in their famous paper from 79. And this is, um, in some sense, this is um, the unique minimal basis, which is fixed by some, um, by the bar involution, which is a Z um, linear involution on the Hecke algebra that sends V to the inverse and HX to the inverse of HX inverse. Okay, and this Kessler and Lustig basis, I want to note this by H underline X. Okay. And then the next step in order to really explicitly construct these representations is to define uh, Kastanostich cells. And so in order to do this, one um, starts with a pre-order. So one says that two elements, so I should say that these are elements X and Y are elements in our um, Cooksetter group. So we'll introduce a pre-order on our group. And we say that X is left smaller or equal than Y if the Kastanostich basis element for x occurs with a non-trivial co uh, coefficient in a product h times the kastan lustig base element corresponding to y for some element h in our Hecke algebra. Okay, and I mean here, of course, that I express this in terms of the kastan lustig basis and this occurs with a non-trivial coefficient. 
Okay. And similarly, one can define pre-orders um, H um, like right cell pre-orders by allowing multiplication on the right here or two-sided uh, pre-orders by allowing multiplication on both sides. Okay. And then the custom list is left respectively right or two-sided cells are exactly the equivalence classes with respect to these pre-orders that one gets. So I said that the original motivation for Kastan and Lustig was to, um, to introduce, um, to explicitly construct representations. So how does this work? I'll just briefly mention this. So if I have a, a left Kastan Lustig cell, so as I said, this is an equivalence class inside our Corsetta group, W, then one can associate to this a cell, a cell module for the Hecker algebra by just taking the span of all the Kastan Lustig basis elements that are um, smaller or equal than some element in our uh, fixed left cell C. So this will already be a left module for our Hecker algebra. But now we want to quotient out the span of all the elements that are smaller or equal than some element in the cell, but and not contained in the cell. So this is what I denote here by x left smaller than C, actually. OK. And it's just from the definition, it's, um, it's immediately clear that one, by doing this, one gets, a, one gets a left module for our heck algebra, OK? And um, so <clears throat> for symmetric groups, the situation is particularly nice. And so what they show is that actually the custom lustig cells, they, um, they can be characterized particularly nice. I mean, they show this in the paper 79, but was later in more detail written up by, by Araki. And they show that for uh, the symmetric group, two elements X and Y in the symmetric group align the same left cell, if and only if under the Robin schoen set correspondence, their Q symbols coincide. So QX equals QY. They align the same right cell, if and only if their P symbols coincide. And they align the same two-sided cell, if PX and PY have the same shape. So this is a particularly nice uh, description of the cells in terms of the robinson schoen set correspondence. And note that I could have also said QX and QY have the same shape because PX and QX are, have the same shape anyways. So we're not breaking the symmetry somehow here. OK. <clears throat> And moreover, for the symmetric group, this case is really particularly nice because something else, um, well, something happens that's really only the case in finite type A, so for the symmetric group. And so if one looks for a left cell in the symmetric group, Kastanusti cell, one looks at the corresponding cell module, and let's just for simplicity extend scalars to C here. This holds a more generality, but we can extend scalars to C by, um, by uh, evaluating our uh, little our deformation parameter v to one, and then um, we get an irreduce, um, we get a representation for the complex um, group algebra C W, and this is actually an irreducible representation for the symmetric group S N. And they show also that all irreducible representations arise in this way. So this is, um, in some senses, the best possible situation that we can that we can hope for. But unfortunately, this only works in finite type A. And, um, but we'll see some more general results, or at least in a, yeah, for, for P cells later that, um, that hold in, in much larger generality as well. OK. Are there any questions about this so far? Before Otherwise, I would continue with the second part. I guess if nobody interrupts me, then I'll just um, keep going. OK, so <clears throat> in the second part, I want to introduce the Picas and Lustig basis. And so uh, in principle, the input for the Picas and Lustig basis, one can sh should think of this as being like a generalized Cartan matrix to which we can associate um, cuts Moody root datum, which um, consists of some finally generated abelian group X and um, sets of roots and co-roots which should be more thought of like positive roots and positive co-roots in the setting here. And we can also, also associate a crystallographic Coxeta system, WS, associated to this data. I mean, how this works is not relevant, um, not precisely relevant for this talk. 
But I want to say that in this talk, we restrict to the case, I mean, this works in this full generality, but we restrict to the case of having a Cartan matrix. So we'll be in the case where our crystallographic Cruxeta system will actually be a VAR group viewed, a, viewed as, a, at a Cruxeta group, as a Cruxeta group, and our root datum will, will be a classical root datum. Okay, and we'll also fix an algebraically closed field of characteristic P, where current, for now, I don't suppose that the characteristic is, strict, uh, is necessarily positive. Okay, and then <clears throat> since this is a workshop on, on categorification, I thought I should maybe say a little bit about the categorification, but I'll mention like two categorifications. There actually should be noted that the, sec uh, the Hecker algebra has actually several equivalent categorifications. And this has been work in the recent years by many, many um, people. And so one categorification I want to mention is um, the algebraic slash diagrammatic categorification, which uh, is due to work of Zergel, Elias Kovanov, um, Lebedinsky, and Elias Williamson. And um, I won't say too much about this, but in principle, some of this has already occurred in um, Chris Bauman's talk yesterday. So let me just mention for the experts that you can use this finite, um, this Katsumuri root datum to cook up a realization. Um, so we'll take the dual of this and then extend scalars for this to our ground fuels K. And we have in the usual way a representation for our, for our group W acting on this. And we use this as realization as input for our, for our diagrammatic category of Zerga bimodules. So I don't want to, I mean, the only thing I want to say about this is one basically starts by first constructing a skeleton, which is um, the category of Bot Samuelson bimodules. And this is an additive monoidal category generated by um, certain objects that are in bijection with our simple reflections S. And then um, from that, one passes to the Caribbean envelope. Okay. And the, the homomorphisms between the objects in this category will be um, isot isotopy classes of certain string diagrams that we've seen in Chris Bowman's talk yesterday. But since I don't have the time to introduce this in more detail, I want to give at least an alternative uh, categorification, where, which is, I mean, quicker to write down, but not necessarily easier to absorb, I would say. And this is a geometric one. And um, this is due to work of um, Kasten and Lustig, um, Daniel Juteau, Karl Mortner, Jordi Williamson. And maybe I should not have added uh, Simurish and Jordi Williamson here because what they actually show is that in this setting, um, in this very general setting, that these two categorifications are equivalent, but I put this on the right hand side here. <clears throat> and so in this setting, what one should think of this, as I said, we fixed the Katsmudi root datum, which um, I mean, more like a based, um, well, which is kind of equivalent to our base root datum uh, as some sort of base root datum. So to this, we can associate if one follows the constructions of Kuma uh, in this, um, when one actually gets out of this a simply connected algebraic group together with a Borel and the maximal torus defined over the complex numbers. And then, <clears throat> um, then from this, one can define and look at the B equivalent bounded constructible derived category following Bernstein and Lunds on the flag variety. So on G mod B, where we fix coefficients to, um, in our field of positive characteristic K, okay? And then <clears throat> this, um, inside this category, we have um, the category, the full category of parity complexes, which was defined by Daniel Juteau, Karl Mortner, and Jordi Williamson uh, of B equivalent parity complexes on the flag variety. And this I want to denote by the geometric uh, Hackey category. And um, this is actually, uh, a monoidal category under convolution. Okay, on the left-hand side, we have um, a monoidal category on the nose. Okay. <clears throat> and um, so I hope that most of you know at least one of the two settings. Um, but um, since I don't have the time to really talk much more about this, I want to at least mention some of the most important properties. And um, these are the following. So. As I said, these two categorifications are equivalent. So from now on, I'll just drop the superscript geometric or diagrammatic and let you choose whichever setting you want to work in. And so <clears throat> the second category has the following properties. So 
as I mentioned already, it's monoidal and it's a Kroll Schmidt category. So Kroll Schmidt means that um, that any object decomposes as a finite direct sum of indecomposable objects. <clears throat> and so since it's a Kroll Schmidt category, it's particularly or um, it's important to understand the, uh, the indie, uh, indecomposable objects. And I've also mentioned that it's graded. So in order to kind of not bother about which kind of indecomposable in a grading family I pick out, I want to say here the self-dual indecomposable objects up to isomorphism. And these are in bijection with our, um, with our value group W in this setting. And I want to denote this, um, the indecomposable object, the self-dual indecomposable object up to iso corresponding to this W, I want to denote this by BW. Okay. And then, <clears throat> as I said, this is a categorification of the Hecker algebra. So in particular, we have an isomorphism of the split Gaussian D group of this Hecker category with the Hecker algebra. And as I mentioned previously, the Hecker algebra is an algebra over Laurent polynomials in one variable. So our monoidal structure induces a multiplication, the additive structure induces an addition, and V acts as a grading shift. And under this isomorphism, on the left-hand side, it's clear that the self-dual indecomposable objects, they give us a basis. And this basis, we want to transport over and call the image of this indecomposable object BW, PH underline W. And <clears throat> now the definition is that, oops, that the collection of all these PH underline W um, is a picasson lustig slash uh, p canonical basis. Okay, are there any questions about this? Um, there's maybe before we take a break, I want to mention um, the most important or most important result about this. And this is um, the result, which was, I mean, in the geometric setting, like in the value group setting already proved by Kassan and Lustig originally and in full generality proved by Elias and Williamson in 2014. And this says that um, for P equals zero, so in characteristic zero, the Picasso Lustig basis actually gives us the Kassan Lustig basis. So that's the motivation why we call this the Picasso Lustig basis. So you should think of this as having being a modular analog of the famous Kassan Lustig basis. So are there any questions about this? I guess otherwise it might be already a good time because otherwise I'll start uh, with the next part to take a little break here. Thank you, Lars. Um... Yes, I think now is a good time to take five minutes. So if anyone has any questions, then please feel free to ask Lars. And if not, we will begin at half past four or half past the hour, whatever time zone you are in. For me, it's half past five, but that's okay. <laughs> I guess there's a Okay, so I guess there's a question in the chat about how much do things break if we don't start with a crystallographic system. So I guess, is this a question about the P-canonical basis or, well, the first thing is already that if one wants to define the P-canonical basis, one needs to, um, I mean, so if you want to work in the geometric setting, then somehow you're kind of bound to the crystallographic setting, but the diagrammatic setting you can define in more generality but you still need as input the uh, realization over your ground field. And since you, if you're not in a crystallographic uh, setting, then um, it's not clear and not, um, I mean, I mean, for certain primes you have realizations for others you don't. And so things become much more complicated. It's not so easy to kind of give a clean, um, to, to just give a clean construction for for arbitrary characteristic. But in principle, like this should generalize to the setting, yes.
So Arun has just asked if um, there are any recent, if there's any recent progress um, regarding a purely heck algebra definition of a p-canonical basis, for example, uh, a p-bar involution. Um, so that's a very interesting question, but um, so far, like I don't see a possibility to kind of characterize the p-canonical basis in terms of, uh, in similar terms as the Kassanustich basis. So I've thought about about this a bit, but there is no, um, I would say there is no, um, yeah, uh, no real progress in this direction. And yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's been much more thought about, oops, I guess my tablet just, um, so there's much been, been much more thought about um, how to characterize, um, just a second, I should share the screen again. Um, there's been much more thought about characterizing, for example, there is a close connection between tilting characters for reductive algebraic groups and antispherical Kastanostic basis. And there's been much more thought about um, about trying to understand um, certain parts of the spherical Kastanostic basis in the sense as trying to understand the combinatorics as as kind of proposed by Lustig and, uh, and Jordi um, like in, in this uh, billiards conjecture. So trying to think, we've thought a lot about this kind of like trying to characterize second generation tilting characters and the combinatorics of the antispherical Kastanostic basis when it comes to this and yeah, other perspectives on this as well. But um, in characterizing the whole basis in terms of an involution on the Hecker algebra, um, um, this, yeah, this seems very difficult currently. And I don't have, yeah, we don't have an idea how to approach this. Okay, so it is now half past. Um, so Lars, you're welcome to continue when you're ready. Okay, so then I'll continue with um, the third part in which I'll talk about the P-salts for symmetric groups. And <clears throat> so, as I mentioned before, so the P-canonical basis, one should think of this um, as a modular analog of the Kastanustich basis. And in view of this result that I've just stated, it's very straightforward to kind of generalize the definition of Kastanustich salts to the p Kastanustich basis. So what we simply do is we replace the Kastanustich basis by the p Kastanustich basis in the definition for the cell preorders. And the equivalence classes that we get for the new uh, p cell preorders, we'll, uh, we'll call this p cells. Okay. And um, so <clears throat> Now it might be um, a bit surprising, but in my PhD thesis, so uh, I actually show that uh, we can carry over exactly the same characterization of um, the, the cells for um, to this P cell setting. So again, two cell elements in the symmetric group, they lie in the same left P cell. If and only if the Q symbols ac um, agree, they lie in the same right P cell if, uh, if and only if the uh, P symbols agree and they lie in the same two-sided p-cell if the p-symbols have the same shape. So in particular, this means that the p-cells and the Kastanustich cells for symmetric groups, they coincide for all primes p. And so from some perspective, this is kind of a, a boring answer because it doesn't give us something, uh, something new. And you could also object that um, now, uh, I haven't even shown you a single example in which the p-kastanustich basis uh, differs from the kastanustich basis. So maybe the statement is just uh, vacuous because somehow like the, in the relevant parts, there is no real difference. But in order to kind of, as an answer to this, I want to mention two results. And so the first thing is that uh, I'm pretty sure most of you have heard of uh, Jordi's counter examples to Lustig's conjecture. And these counterexamples, they provide examples where the p basis uh, differs from the Kastanostich basis in various symmetric groups. 
And so why do I say in symmetric groups? Because in principle, Lustig's conjecture uh, is concerned with um, irreducible characters for reductive al or for algebraic groups. So this is more governed by the affine value group. But Jordi works, uh, first of all, in type A and in this toy model around the Steinberg weight, uh, weight, which is governed by actually the finite value group. So for that reason, all these examples give us examples where they differ. And then very recently, um, there was a lot of hope also that somehow, um, somehow the singularities and Schubert varieties um, for fixed points, where basically the, the fixed point and the indexing element for the Schubert variety lie in the same, um, in the same cell, that these uh, uh, singularities would be kind of better behaved. But this hope was, um, was destroyed by, by a result by Martina Lanini and uh, Peter McNamara who give, um, I mean, I think this is a result from, from this year, and they give an algorithm which allows to uh, pattern embed a, a Bruja interval x, y of a symmetric group into an interval u, uh, w in a larger symmetric group such that the extremes of the new interval actually lie in the same, um, uh, in the same Kassanosti cell. So as I mentioned previously, so also in the same P cell, of course, okay? And um, by results of, uh, I'm not sure whether I pronounce this no, uh, name correctly, Wu and Yong, I think, um, this, this implies that affine neighborhoods of the corresponding Schubert varieties at the T fixed points, so of the Schubert variety corresponding to Y, which is the larger element at the T fixed point for X, and the Schubert variety corresponding to W at the T fixed point for U, uh, respectively are isomorphic up to a Cartesian product uh, with affine space. And in particular, since um, coming from this geometric perspective, the, the P canonical basis encodes uh, information about the singularities of these Schubert varieties. Um, and this implies in particular that the, the base change coefficients, if I express the P Kassanustig basis, in terms of the Kassanustig basis, these are these base change coefficients, P uh, superscript M and then the, the corresponding elements on uh, below that they actually coincide. And um, so for, for the elements uh, of the two intervals here. And what that, what that means is that whenever you have a, um, um, a case where the P Kastanustic basis differs from the Kastanustic basis, so in particular, all the examples that Jordi provides, you can use this combinatorial algorithm by uh, Martina Lanini and Peter McNamara to actually embed this into a larger symmetric group in such a way that um, the non-trivial base change coefficient that you see between the Picanonical and the Kassanustich basis actually occurs already within the same right cell, within one cell, okay? And from that perspective, um, that gives us now a huge family of cases where already in the cell module, the bases um, uh, differ, okay? Okay, are there any questions about this before I move on to the, to the next part? Well, I guess, let me see if there's something in chat. No, okay. Well, then I wanna move on and talk a little bit about um, the Pavan-Forbinus theorem and its consequences for P-cells. And so this is um, a very classical result that's already over a hundred years old, I think. And so, I hope all of you know this. And so let me just recall this uh, very, very briefly. So if you have a matrix, uh, a K by K matrix, uh, whose entries are strictly positive, then the Pamaphobinus theorem says that there is a, um, a positive real number, lambda, which is an eigenvalue of the matrix M. And uh, it occurs with algebraic multiplicity one. And in particular, this, uh, this positive real number is the spectral radius of our matrix M. So any other eigenvalue, complex eigenvalue of our matrix has norms strictly smaller than lambda. So this is the second part. And moreover, I mean, of course, we can find an eigenvector for this eigenvalue. But um, moreover, we can sh um, the eigenvector has strictly, I mean, we can, we can we can choose it so that all its components are strictly positive, okay? And it has a nice property that we can actually um, recognize um, kind of 
this Perron Frobenius eigenvector in the sense that if we find another eigenvector for our matrix whose components are non negative entries, then this is actually already a, a scalar multiple of our, um, of our uh, Perron Frobenius eigenvector V. Okay. So this is uh, particularly nice. And so, <clears throat> I mean, you can say a lot more properties about this, but I just want to recall these because this is what. Uh, what we'll use in the following. And now um, Kiletopt and Mazurchuk, they had this idea of studying the consequences for this, uh, for, P, uh, for cell theory in general. And in order to apply their results, and I'm gonna, I'm mostly I'm gonna just apply their results and refine them slightly. And um, so in order to do this, we need to fix, um, we need to fix um, positive real coefficients for any element of our, um, of our value group. And then we'll define what I like to call um, a Parmaphobinius element, this B subscript D, to be the linear combination of the pika sich base element with these fixed coefficients. And I want to view this just for simplicity again inside the um, complex um, group algebra of our value group. Okay. And moreover, I want to consider um, a left P cell C in, uh, in our value group. And then it's, um, it's an immediate application of the Parmaphobinius theorem that whenever I act with this Parmaphobinius element on our cell module here, by the <clears throat> transitivity of our cell, we can see that the matrix actually has only strictly positive co uh, coefficients. And so we can apply the theorem. And I want to denote the Parmaphobinius eigenvalue by H subscript D of C. And then we can um, we know that when we decompose this um, cell module in terms of irreducible modules for our uh, for our value group, then there will be a new a re, unique irreducible module that actually affords this um, this uh, Frobenius power eigenvalue. And since it's uh, the Frobenius power eigenvalue has algebraic multiplicity one, we also know that the corresponding irreducible module, which I want to denote by L subscript C comma D occurs with multiplicity one. So all this is like an immediate application of Parmaphobinius. And all, all this is already pretty nice, but um, it gets much better. So <clears throat> the, the first thing that one observes is that this irreducible module actually does not depend on the choice of our parameters. Okay, this is uh, it's nice too. And then one can go on and uh, and show that actually if one takes two left cells inside the same two-sided um, p cell so here i make this um i mean i still differentiate between cells and p cell uh, casanosic cells and p cells because uh in principle these results hold for an arbitrary um finite value group and in which case the cells and the casanosic cells and the p cells do not necessarily coincide okay and um so in this case, what one can show is that the, um, that the simple modules to the, associated to these two um, left P cells, that they're isomorphic and that the corresponding A uh, values that I defined also coincide. And the proof for this is, uh, is very simple. It's very nice. So just by the transitivity of, um, of our um, two-sided cells, we know we can move from a fixed element in our uh, cell C to, uh, in, uh, to an element in, in C prime, just by multiplying with something on the left and on the right, since we can move from any element in a two-sided cell to any other in this way. And then we can, the first thing we're, go we're gonna do is we're gonna construct uh, a non-zero homomorphism between the cell modules by just multiplying with the corresponding element on the right. So, <clears throat> and then using this property, that this is, will be like a le left cell module homomorphism. And using the property that uh, our Parmaphobinius uh, eigenvector has strictly positive coefficients, we can um, we know that it will be sent to a, um, to a non-zero uh, uh, linear combination that has non-negative coefficients in this other cell module. 
And by this last property of the theorem that we mentioned, we actually see that the image will still be an eigen uh, eigenvector corresponding to the uh, uh, paraphobenius um, eigenvalue. And um, so in particular, these eigenvalues um, coincide. And Schur's lemma will give us that the corresponding uh, irreducible modules are isomorphic as well. So this is uh, a very simple and um, very nice little argument that, uh, that shows this. And um, one can go even a little bit further. And well, one thing I wanted to mention is that this A function, as I mentioned, now due to this property, we can view this as some sort of candidate for generalizing uh, Lustig's A function. So because from this, from this theorem, we can deduce immediately that basically this defined, the A function defined in this way, of course, it depends on our parameters D, but um, that will be constant on two-sided cells. Okay, two-sided P cells. And now um, another very nice property of this is, um, so since we have um, the, the complex uh, group algebra of our Val group, which is filtered by, um, by our two-sided uh, P cells, and uh, we know that um, since it's a semi-simple algebra, we know that any irreducible representation occurs with the with its the multiplicity of any irreducible representation occurring inside the regular representation is given by its dimension, and it has to occur with this multiplicity since it's a filtration by two-sided ideals exactly in one filtration piece, and so this allows us to kind of give us a partition of um, the irreducible representations of W in terms of two-sided P cells. And so we do this by saying that um, the partition or the subset associated to a two-sided P cell will be precisely those irreducible representations that occur non-trivially in the corresponding two-sided cell module. And I want to denote this or call this the P family associated to J. And I'll explain later why I want to call this this way. And um, <clears throat> moreover, as I said previously, we know that this irreducible like module we've attached to a left P cell, this occurs in any other left, um, left cell in the same two-sided cell. And we know it occurs with multiplicity, um, with multiplicity precisely uh, its dimension. And one can also deduce from this that actually the number of left cells inside the two-sided cell of C is given by this dimension of this uh, this irreducible representation that we associated to C. And I also want to denote this, um, this LC and call this the P special module. And the reason behind this is that Kiletov and Mazurchuk in the setting of the Kassenlustig basis, so they don't think about P Kassenlustig basis in principle, um, they show that in terms of the Kassenlustig basis, this gives the classical definition of Lustig for special modules, which is a bit um, complicated. I don't want to I mean, I don't want to go into this. This is defined in terms of certain generic and fake degree polynomials, but yeah, let's not go into this. And um, also Lustig already shows, I mean, Lustig has also definitions for families of, of irreducible representations of Val groups, which occur in, um, in his work on, on, on characters for um, um, finite groups of Lie type. And um, this comes is closely related to Delin Lustig theory. And he also shows in his uh, big orange book that actually this definition of families also coincides in terms of the Kassen Lustig basis of, uh, coincides with his classical definition, which is also, um, yeah, slightly different. Okay. And so this is the motivation why I want to call this P special modules and P families. And so, let us look at this in um, in one example. Okay, <clears throat> so in type uh, B two in characteristic two. So for finite type B two, the only case for which the P Kassenlustig basis differs from the Kassenlustig basis is for P equals two. And um, in this case, one should also note that the Kassenlustig basis only depends on the Coxeter uh, system, whereas the Pika Lustig basis actually depends really on this Cartan matrix. So it sees which root is short and which is long. So in this case, let's assume that S is the short root and T is the long one. And on the left, you see the Kassen-Lustig left and two-sided cells. 
So we have uh, the identity element and the longest element, which form a, a left and two-sided cell on, on their own. And then we have um, what Lustig calls strings. So you fix the right descent set, S, and then S, T, S, and S, T, S, they form a left cell. And T, S, T, and T, S, T also form a left cell. And together, these two cells give you a two-sided cell. And th in the setting of two cells, so for P equals two, you see that this element S splits off, forms a left and two-sided cell on, on its own, and the remaining elements um, still form a two-sided two-cell. OK. And in this setting, uh, what does one get for, uh, for the two special modules? So this is also in the classical case this way. So one gets the identity, which gives you sign. The longest element gives you the trivial representation. And this element S gives you um, one of these mixed representations, which I call uh, sign S, so where S acts by one and T, S, um, T acts by minus one. And then the, this big two-sided two-cell, um, or in each of these, we have as, as irreducible as two special representation, the geometric representation occurring here. And note that this is the only one that's two-dimensional. And this also shows we have two left P-cells inside this two-sided uh, two-cell. And um, yeah, and the two families associated, I mean, the only case which is interesting is, um, is here that uh, for this biggest, for this two-sided two cell that contains elements of both strings here, in this case, we have the geometric representation and the analog sign T kind of uh, in this, which, which only occurs, um, in, well, in only one of these, um, these two cell modules. OK. And so in principle, this is, I think, an interesting question. And I don't have any idea what the kind of connection of these two special modules and these two families are to uh, the Lean-Lustig theory in other areas. I mean, Lustig has, um, yeah, I mean, uses this notion of families um, quite a lot. So this would be very interesting to investigate. But yeah, if you have any ideas, I'd be happy to to talk about this, but I don't, yeah, I don't have many ideas. So, <clears throat> and now, um, if one puts in a lot more work, then uh, one can prove um, what is called property A. And this says that left P cells within the same two-sided P cell are actually incomparable. So, in other words, this this says that if you take two elements in our in our value group, then if they lie already in the same two-sided P cell, and you have a left P cell a pre-order relation between them, then they actually have to already lie in the same left p-cell. Okay. So uh, this is, if you know the classical Kassanustich setting a bit, this is one of the consequences of, um, well, it's it's a weak form of one of the 15 conjectures that Lustig states for Hecker algebra with unequal parameters. And in this setting, it's often formulated, it's, I think, p9 or p um, P, uh, P10, and it's often formulated in the way that you require to have the A functions to coincide. So for that reason, I'm, I'm saying it's a slightly weaker formulation. And yeah, it's often proven using, using um, yeah, I mean, definitely the A function and also Lustig's um, asymptotic um, Hecker algebra, which is not available in this setting. And now um, consequences of this are that the equivalence relation um, for the two-sided p-cells is actually generated by the equivalence relation for the left p-cells and the right p-cells. So not only the pre-orders, but really by the equivalence relations it's, uh, it's generated. And it's another consequence is that these two-sided p-cells, they are actually the smallest subject, uh, subsets that are at the same time unions of left p-cells and of right p-cells. Okay. Are there any questions about this before I move on to my last part? Doesn't look like it. Okay. Well, then <clears throat> let me now move on to the last part in which I want to come back to our classical example, our running example in some sense. And I want to suppose that the Cartan matrix we fixed is of type IN minus one. So the, Kruxeta, the crystallographic Kruxeta group is actually the symmetric group with the trans simple transpositions. And now um, I want to define a cellular datum for the, for the Hacker algebra. And so first I want to denote by lambda this, the set of partitions of N. 
and I want to equip this with a dominance order. Then I want to define also for a solid idiom, one needs an a anti involution on our algebra. So for us, this will be a ZVV minus one a linear anti involution on the Hecker algebra, which sends HX to HX inverse. So it fixes the HS for the simple reflections. And uh, moreover, I mean, this is exactly as it is for the Kassen Lustig basis. I want to denote by this the set M lambda, which um, for for partition of n, I want to denote by M lambda the set of standard tableau of shape lambda. And um, I want to define as the images of um, under this combinatorial map C, which maps kind of like the union of all these pairs of of standard tableau into our algebra. I want to use the Robinson Schön set correspondence to map a pair. Pw and Qw to the corresponding Picas and Lustig basis element corresponding to W. Okay. And just in order to make the notational slightly, because Pw, I mean, the Kassan Lustig pH underline W doesn't denote which kind of cell this lies in. And also for the relation, I mean, of the, in the cell datum, it might be more useful. I want to introduce also this notation of C superscript and then. P, W, Q, W as subscripts, if um, W is of shape lambda, or these P and Q symbols are of shape lambda. Okay. And now, um, so if you know the classical setting in which um, it is proven that the Kassanustic basis gives a cell datum, then this, you'll notice that this is precisely, ex or this is exactly the same setting um, as for the Kassanustic basis that we're fixing here. And now, I want to mention because otherwise it seems completely tautological uh, that there are still like two missing ingredients somehow in order to see the cellularity really. And the first one is that the two sided P cell preorder actually coincides with the dominance order on partitions under the Robin Schoen set correspondence. And um, so this is an important ingredient. And the second ingredient that one still needs is, is um, that in some sense, um, the the structure coefficients when one acts on a left P cell module inside a two sided cell, that they do not depend on the actual left cell we in. That these the structure coefficients that occur, um, they are actually I mean, they are independent of the cell we are in. Okay, and here you can formulate this using Kasanovsky star operations. But since I'm already over time, I don't want to like give this um, explain this notation further. And then what I can show is, um, is precisely that this data gives a cell datum for our Hecker algebra. And just because I didn't recall the definition, I wanted to mention that this basically consists of three parts. And the first two parts are uh, very easy in the setting. So it says that this image of this, uh, this combinatorial map C gives a, a basis for the Hecker algebra. This is clear because we fixed the picanonical basis. This is a certain combinatorial property um, that this basis element under this anti-evolution um, basically is just sent to the basis element where I swap the two parameters, the two standard tableau. And this follows more or less from the, the robinson schoen set correspondence and the symmetry theorem. And in the, <clears throat> in the last part, the most important part where these two kind of ingredients go in, this is kind of this, the statement that if I take um, a basis element corresponding to P and Q, um, of shape lambda, and I multiply by anything on the left, the occurring um, coefficients, they're actually independent of Q. And this is uh, precisely this last part that I mentioned here. So these coefficients here that occur uh, are exactly independent of Q. And this, um, for this, in order to, uh, one needs to work kind of in a cell quotient. And also to see that this is a cell quotient, one also needs to kind of match up the corresponding pre-orders, okay? So yeah, so this is, I think, um, all, I want, all I wanted to say about this. And um, I just want to make one last uh, kind of unrelated comment. And this is um, the following. And this is that a new algorithm that I implemented allows to calculate um, many new tilting characters for SL3, SP4, G2, and SL4. And this shows that actually the Lustig-Williamson conjecture on second generation tilting characters for SL3, so the billiards conjecture needs to be slightly corrected. So, but since this is kind of technical, I kind of, I decided not to talk about this, but if you're interested in this, you can contact me and, or wait for the,
paper to, uh, um, to appear in the archive. Yeah, now I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Um, so if we could all um, thank Lars for his great talk. And now people are welcome to ask questions. Can I ask a, a question? Uh, and so your uh, last result, uh, uh, does it say, does it, it seems it implies that uh, um, the P cell theory uh, provides uh, um, a specific lattice in, uh, in uh, um, some irreducible representation of the Hecker algebra. If you take coefficients over Q, but then you take Laurent polynomials in VV inverse. Okay, so that's something you see if you use, for example, Lustig's J ring. Uh, when you look at Lustig's J ring over Q, it's a product of matrix algebras. Uh, and mm -hmm. so you have unique, you have unique lattices. Uh, um, I mean, you have your, your Q modules. You add, you tensor by Z, Q of VV inverse, so Laurent polynomials, and then you pull back to the Hecker algebra. So you have these well-defined kind of special modules uh, like that. Uh, so your theorem says that uh, implies probably that something like that is um, is true in this case. And do you expect something like that to be true in general? Uh, well. I mean, first of all, in general, it's a bit difficult because I still don't have a, a way to define Lustig's J ring. I mean, because it's kind of not so clear how to generalize, define Lustig, Lustig's A function. So you don't need the J ring for that, okay? For that, you just need to, uh, you can do it directly with, uh, with I think, with left set of modules. Uh, uh, um, that uh, uh, some of you, if you filter, well, another way would be to say you filter your Hecker algebra. Uh, using uh, uh, using your filtration and some of the slices uh, uh, would be uh, direct sums uh, over Q of VV inverse would be direct sums of certain specific uh, lattices in uh, irreducible modules. So that's a question. It doesn't require um, you to construct anything. Uh, uh. Okay, this is something I've not thought about, but it's very interesting. So <laughs> I think your theorem implies that. Uh, okay, <laughs> I believe your theorem probably the celerity probably. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. So in type A, yeah, I can very well imagine this. And in other types, um, I would definitely need to think about this. But in so, type A, in type A, do you know that you recover uh, special modules? I mean, the, I'm talking over Q scalar. You take Q coefficients, but put Laurent polynomial in VV inverse. Do you know that these are the special modules you're getting? Uh, them this I'm not sure because there are certain integrality statements for the cell modules, but I'm not sure um in which setting i th i thought kind of you need to well i mean at least the reference i had in my head i think works over the quotient field of Laurent polynomials in one variable and i'm not sure yeah okay thanks yeah i would need to yeah i would need to think about this in this generality thank you Does anyone else have a question for Lars? If not, I think we should uh, turn off the recording and thank our speaker.